Uh, so, uh, first, uh, just in case uh, you saw the announcement, uh, so instead of today's quiz and the quiz we would have on Tuesday and Monday, I just gave you like a assignment, like a four problems um, instead of as like a replacement of those two quizzes. Uh, basically, uh, the idea is like I kind of trying to finish the material of the course, like definitely by next week. Um, so I prefer to have like a little bit of extra time for lecture just in case so that we don't cover anything new on the on the on the week of the final exam. Uh, so that Monday, the final exam is on Wednesday, which is the last day of class. So that Monday, we could just do more like of a review session or something like that instead of but definitely I don't want to cover any any new material. So just like in like we don't have that many topics left actually. Um so if like my idea for today was like was kind of to give you some examples of um joint distributions because like last time I, I feel like I just gave a bunch of definitions. So do some more things more like on the computational side. That would also help set up the stage for the last part of the course, which is more like the limit theorems. So again, like there are two like uh, common um theorems or very famous theorems in probability. One like the strong uh, the law of large numbers, and the other one is uh the central limit theorem. So again, um, I'll think about how much of a proof to give, but at least definitely we will discuss them um uh, and write them write them down. So yeah, but. But, but again, my idea is kind of to wrap up the material of the course sometime and by sometime next week. Um, so today, uh, let me start by giving you some examples of uh, what we were talking about um, on Wednesday when, uh, regarding like uh, two random variables. So just, a, a, just as an analogy, remember when you have one random variable, X, then this one um, in the continuous case, let's start just with the continuous random variables. This one had like a density function, right? F of X. Here I'm like, like the notation can be a little bit um, a no, um, of a nuisance, but it's kind of useful to have some, some notation Otherwise, it would become a mess uh, very soon. So, this like means like the density function associated to the random variable x. So again, the random variables like their names are usually like uppercase letters, and then the variable is uh lowercase. So, I'll try to make one bigger than the other to make a distinction. But the b basic property of this density function is that the probability for the random variable to be between two values a and b is an integral from a to b of the density dx. Okay, that's kind of like the key feature of the of the density. Okay, and uh, once you have two random variables, right? Um, so now when you have two random variables. Uh, x and y is what you have instead of like the density function is like this joint density function. So you have the joint density function. Okay. 
And in here it is, um, okay, there are two ways to think about it, uh, but in, in either case, we need like a picture of what's going on. So, <laughs> she's kind of obsessed with plants at this point of her growth stage. So, <laughs> uh, like when they say one variable, like, you know, you kind of just care about intervals typically for the values that like the random variable can take. When you have two random variables, right? Um, in fact, let's make this like as a picture. Like, you can think that here you you had like the x axis, and you had like an interval from a to b, right? But when you have uh two random variables, like you probably remember this from calc three, like then a lot more interesting things can happen, right? You could have like an x and y axis. And you may not care about like um, the variables taking place like on a on a square or rectangle. You could have like a more interesting region uh, on the xy plane. So let me put it like this. Let's draw this here. So you could have some region here on the xy plane. Let's call this region R. Okay, and so instead now of what, what you care about is for uh, the probability for, um, you know, X comma Y um, to be inside this region. So maybe I should, before uh, doing, before writing that down, you know, let me introduce just a, a, sl a slight, a tiny bit more notation. When you have uh, two random variables, if you want, you can define, you can think of them as a, as a vector, right? Like you can think of this as a, as a vector, which is X I plus Y J. Okay. This is actually sometimes called, I mean, it is called like a random vector. So if you ever hear like the word random vector, it just means that it's a vector whose entries are random variables. So now what you care about is like the probability, like you would like the point of this joint density function. In fact, you could just write it as, if you prefer like a more uh, succinct notation, you can write it like this. Is is you care now about the probability for the random vector to belong inside, to land in some region uh, on the XY plane. So the idea is that uh, the probability for this random vector to, buy, to lie in this region, which you can write as X comma Y is in the region R, that is given as the double integral over R of this density function. Is that making sense? That's kind of like the, the the definition of what the density function is supposed to you to do for you when you have two random variables. It gives you the probability that like the the, the values of the random variables uh, belong to a particular region uh, on the x of the x y plane. Is that making sense? So um, I was about to give you some examples, but. Uh, that is like a concrete way to think about what this density function is. In in one variable, it's more or less only intervals that you care about. Uh, but when you have two variables, then like you know, it, it is more makes more sense for not work just with like rectangular regions. But I mean, you may remember from Calc two that you know, um, like sometimes a region of, of integration or like disks or triangles or something else, right? So that's kind of what uh, this is supposed to do for you um, by allowing R to be like just some region of the XY plane. So let me give you some examples um, about this.
So let's talk, like the easiest uh, case is a uniform distribution. So if you remember the uniform distribution, let's start again with one variable because that's just easier. If you have like an interval AV, right? The point of the uniform distribution for a random, so here's like uh, in the case of one random variable. Uh, for a finite interval, right? Like the idea of the uniform distribution is that if, like the random variable takes values inside this interval with kind of with the same amount every point kind of contributes the same amount of probability or is equally likely. So the way in which we had written down uh, that in terms of a density was that the, the, the density of the uniform distribution was one over B minus A, right? That, ha that we had to divide by the length of the interval because remember we always want the integral of the density to be, uh, to integrate to one, right? So. This was needed for th this factor of one over v minus n was needed in order to to integ to integrate that to one. But like philosophically, the the point of the uniform distribution or the uniform density is that kind of like uh, everything had like you know the probability of, of finding the random variable uh, somewhere is just uh, kind of like the same, right? There's no point on the interval that's preferred. Um, so what's the analog of for run for two random variables? Let's think about that. So what is what would be the case in, of two random variables? Well, now again, you no longer have like um the x-axis, you have the x and the y-axis. So instead, like in the case of the uniform distribution, um, you know, if you have like a region R. Right. Well, the easiest thing to do would, would be to, uh, you know, you kind of want to make every piece of this region equally likely or just proportional to its size. Okay. So the easiest thing is kind of to define this as like the integral. Of, I mean, the density is one over the area of the region, right? Because in that case, if you integrate this over R, right? Um, that is going to integrate to one, right? Uh, so here I should, uh, I mean, I should maybe uh, to be more precise, like what I mean here is like, this is one over the area. So this is one over the over the area. If X comma Y belongs to R and zero otherwise. So it's kind of like, uh, we know for sure that the, that the values are somewhere in this region. So the density is zero outside the region. And once you are inside the region, like the, the value for the density is one over the area. Is that making sense? So that is, um, you know, that is kind of the easiest way to make uh, every point in the region count, count the same. And like the same was here for the uniform distribution of one random variable. So this was one over V minus A if um, X is between B and A and zero otherwise. Just to clarify, like graphically, both of these would just be like planes or lines, right? Uh, yeah, so like, for example, in one variable, I mean, you mean like the graph, uh, yeah, I imagine, yeah. right? So. For one variable, like if you had a v, let's see, if you had the interval a v, like the graph of the uniform distribution, yeah, it just looks like a a, a line somewhere in here, 
So this would be the graph of the uniform distribution. And then, um, okay, this one is going to be harder to, to make. Um, so this is a graph, right? And for two variables, right? Uh, now you have like a third axis needed, right? So you have like the region R here. And yeah, there, I mean, it, it's kind of six, precisely on top of it, right? Like some floating disk of height equal to one over the area, right? Which, yeah, so this is like, the, the graph looks, like literally looks like a copy of the, of the region R, but you just lifted it, lifted by a height equal to the, the inverse of the area, right? So that's like how the graph looks like. Is that making sense? Um, so. So it's, yeah, it's always like a copy of the region downstairs uh, uh, lifted by a certain amount. It is a equation of a plane, as you're saying. It's just, uh, uh, I mean, like a constant plane. It's just that I'm cutting it according to the bounds of the uh, of the region downstairs. So it's not necessarily like a full plane, right? Or um, But let's let's work it out in some two special cases, which are kind of useful. Uh, so the first one is just, is like the rectangle, right? So let's say that R is a rectangle. Usually it's kind of like the same as in Calc 3. If you remember Calc 3, uh, when you are sending the bounds of integration, you don't really need to look at the, uh, at the graph, the bound of the function, right? Like the bounds of integration are really determined by what's going on on the XY plane, on the XY plane, if like, the function was a function of two variables. It's kind of like similar perspective here. Uh, you'll see that most of the stuff you can understand by just looking at what's going on on the XY plane without having to try to graph the, the, the density. So there's no need to, in, in general, there's no need to graph the density. It can be useful, of course, to plot it uh, from time to time, but for setting up the bounds of integration and things like that, uh, you don't really need it. So yeah, if you had like a, a rectangle on the x y plane, a where x goes from b a to b and y goes from c to d. So let me just write that down. A x goes from um, the random. You know for sure that the random variable takes values. The x part get takes values between a and b, and the y part takes values between c and d. Sorry, I should write that here. C and d. Well, then, uh, right, like you know that the area of this rectangle is just, um, you know, the area is of the rectangle is literally B minus A times D minus C, right? So what's the density? The density in this case is just one over the area, oops. Looks very well. Okay, is one over the area uh, let me write it explicitly here one over b minus a d minus c if uh again if x comma y if x is between a and b and y is between c and d and zero otherwise. Okay, and once you have that, if you remember, once you have the joint distribution, from the joint distribution, you can find like the individual distributions or densities by just integrating one of the variables. So for example, um, these are some like called the marginal densities or yeah, that's like usually the name that you give to them. In the finite case, were like the ones that we obtained by adding up uh, all the entries in one row or column, if you remember. But this, by the like, I think I wrote the formula somewhere here last time. Let me see. Ah, here it is. And you using the same color by accident. That's good. So this, by definition, is the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the joint density function. And you integrate with respect to y because the idea is that by integrating with respect to y, 
kind of after you did the integral with respect to y, you kind of lose that integral, uh, that variable, right? So the, the stuff that remains only can depend on x. That, again, should remind you, hopefully, of what happened um, in Calc 3 when you had double integrals, right? Like when you would integrate with respect to one of the variables, the point is that, uh, that what you got only depended on the variable you didn't integrate uh, with respect to. So in this case, uh, what is this integral equal to? Well, this integral, this function is zero, right? No, remember, uh, here, here the integral is happening with respect to y. And this function is zero unless y is between c and d. So this is really an integral from c to d of, uh, of whatever this was, one over b minus a, d minus c. Is that making sense? And so this gives you d minus c over b minus a, uh, d minus c. Uh, so that means that the marginal or the density for x, right? The density for x is one over b minus a. Okay. So that's, what is that? That's a uniform distribution for, that is a uniform distribution for x, right? Uh oh, which makes sense um, because this is like a rectangle. Uh, so we're kind of making, you know, any, if every region here is kind of equally likely to, um, is weighted according just to its area, then it does make sense that X would be this distributedly, distributed uniformly. So this is just uh, the uniform distribution for X. And likewise, uh, I mean, it is, kind of the same process. So I won't write all the steps. Uh, but for, for, for the marginal for Y, now you integrate with respect to X and here you will find one over T minus C. So it's like the uniform distribution for Y. Is that making sense? Is that okay? So uh, again, so the joint was like the joint distribution was uh, one over D minus C times the, uh, one over B minus A. And this one happens to be the joint of uh, the, the marginal for Y and this one is the marginal for x, the marginal density for x. So this is an example where the random variables x and y are independent because uh, the joint distribution factorized as the product. Is that making sense? So here, these x and y are independent since f of x, y factorizes. factorizes. Is that okay? Questions up to this point? Oops, let me let you. Is that okay? Now, uh, let's do this in a slightly more interesting example, which is a disk. So we can do it also for even for the unit disk. So let's try to do the same for the unit disk. So let's take our region to be the unit disk. The, the standard unit disk center at the origin. Well, as you know, the area of the unit is just pi, right? Because R squared equals one. So area of R is just pi. So the joint distribution or the joint density is just um, 
you know, it's one over pi if the vector or if the point x comma y belongs to the disk, it's inside the disk, and zero otherwise. Is that, is that okay? And once you have from the joint distribution, you can find the, the marginal distribution. So let's try to find the marginal here. What is the marginal distribution for X? Again, you integrate this joint density or the marginal density for X. You inter integrate the joint density with respect to Y, right? So what does that mean? Again, uh, hopefully this reminds you of COP3 uh, because uh, here Y is the one that's varying, right? Y is changing, so that means that you have fixed X. So you have to focus on a single vertical line that you see here, which I'm coloring now in blue, right? Now remember the equation of the unit circle is x squared plus y squared equals one. And so now these, these uh, you know, this thing will be zero unless you are inside the, the disk, right? Or inside the circle. So you have to find the bounds for y that put you inside the disk, right? So again, think of this as a double integral. Well, I mean, this kind of like how you would set up like the double integral in, in Cartesian for the unit disk, right? I'm, I'm doing it here now fixing like that, the value for X. So I'm using uh, this order, the Y, the X, if you remember what that was. So what do I put here? Um, what should be the bounce here for Y? Negative one to one? Well, that's the thing. It cannot be negative one to one because if you put negative one to one, it would be more like the bounce for a square or a rectangle, right? Uh, Remember, like for example, notice that if you had chosen like a different uh, value for X, imagine that you, let me see if I can zoom in. It, maybe this will be better. If I choose like an, a different value for X, right? Now that you have this purple line, you see that the values for Y would be smaller, right? Than the values here. So the bounds for Y cannot be the same. Uh, uh, right, it, well, um, Yes, it, uh, there's only one curve here, but right, if you start with the equation for the for the curve, which is the circle, you can say that y squared is one minus x squared, so y is plus or minus root of one minus x squared. So the bounds for y are um, from y equals minus root of one minus x squared to root of one minus x squared. Is that making sense? Is that clear why it's not negative one to one? Because like the bounds for the, like, you know, the value for Y on the disk is not constant, right? Like, you know, here Y goes from this value to this value, but that's less from the values that Y would take here. So if you fix the value for X, the value that Y takes uh, do de does depend on X, right? Is that, is that making sense? That makes sense, yeah. Uh, good. And well, now uh, this integral is really easy to do because uh, it's just like a constant inside the integral. So you just get um, you get what you get two root of one minus x squared over pi. Uh, yeah, you could also have said it's even, so you can just multiply by two. Um, right. Um. Or it's just like, like the length of the interval, right? It's one over pi times the length of the interval. So, or the length, right? The length of the of the bounce for me. But yeah, like there are different ways to say it, but um, 
that's what you would get. And the the formula for y is completely analogous, but now it's kind of like, um, you know, it's one over pi, you're integrating with respect to x. So x goes from minus root of one minus y squared to root of one minus y squared. So you get two root of one minus y squared over pi. Is that okay? So in this case, like, uh, notice that the variables x and y are not ran independent random variables because their densities do not multiply to the, right? Notice that here, f of x, x times f of y, y is not f, it's not the joint density, right? So, so x, y are not independent. Is, is that making sense? Uh, it, it kind of makes, I mean, a uh, reason to think of why the, they're not independent is like, if you think about it, uh, you want the values of X and Y to always lie in the unit disk. So you always need this inequality to, inequality to be satisfied. So, because you always want this inequality to be satisfied, knowing the values of X kind of restrict the values for Y, right? Uh, I mean, like, they don't maybe fix it completely, but they do tell you something about the values for Y, because Y has to kind of adjust itself so that it will make the inequality still continue to work. And likewise, knowing the values for Y would force the values for X to take particular bounds because, like, uh, otherwise the inequality would not be satisfied. So in order for X and Y to always satisfy the inequality, their values cannot be completely independent. It cannot be independent from one another, right? Um, is, is that making sense? So since uh, this inequality must be satisfied, kind of like the, the value for X and Y have to work with some sort of coordination. Must um can be can be uh, you know must uh, be related somehow. Can they can't be independent? Is that okay? But now uh, let, let's let's do this. Uh, continuing with this example, um, let's continue with in the region uh, of the unit disk, right? So once you have from x and y, you can define a new random variable, okay? Using x and y. So still in this example, still in this example of the unit disk. Uh, let's define uh, let's define uh, let's see let's see uh, hello so it's annoying okay let's define this random variable Uh, actually, that's like, <laughs> you kind of run my mind. This is what I'm doing secretly now, right? Because this is kind of what you would call, this more or less corresponds to the R from polar coordinates, correct? This is like the R from polar coordinates.
The only reason why I'm not calling it R, uh, first is like it's okay. First, for two reasons, uh, it is very common when you start with two random variables x and y, the the random variables that you define out of them to be called z or w. So that's one reason. And the other reason is that if I were to call this big R, first big R usually sometimes you think it's more common to think about it as a constant, you know, like the radius of a circle. So that would be confusing. And then uh, also like it would get in the mass, uh, it will get, it would be problematic when you are trying to find its density because um, you'll see we're going to switch to polar. So uh, there will be like some, it would be like a bit of a notational overkill, but is this is literally, you know, uh, you know, root of x squared plus y squared is literally like the R from polar. It's just that I'm happen to call it, I'm calling it Z. Okay. But that like, it is like the R from polar coordinates, right? But again, I'm trying to stick with Z because that's kind of like the name that typically is given to a, a random variable that you build out of old ones. So that's just the only reason why I'm doing this. Okay, so this is like a random variable and as a random variable, we can find its density function, right? So the problem would be to find its density function. Once, uh, here's like the thing, here's what you have to think about. Once you have the density function, you kind of know everything else or more or less uh, everything else you need because uh, the density is what's needed to find the ex expected values and the moments and the variance, almost everything. And you cannot find almost anything about the random variable unless you have the density. So the density is fundamental. Uh, remember, how do you find a density? To find a density, you have to find the, you need to compute, to compute uh, the probability the the random variable is less or equal to some value, and then and then the density f of c is like the derivative of this probability with respect to the variable. Is that okay? So in order to find the density of a random variable, you always start here, which is sometimes what that's called the distribution function of the random variable. It's not a name that I have used too much, but that's kind of how it's called. Um, okay, so first of all, notice that like the random variable, um, this Z, in this case, is always between zero and one because we're still in the case of the unit disk, right? So. First, it's always non-negative. Like that's just from the fact that it's a square root. And since like X and Y are constrained to take values inside the unit disk, we know, in this case, we always know that um, this is uh, between zero and one. Uh, so that's good. And that corresponds to the fact, you know, that if you were going to set up like a double integral polar coordinates for the unit disk, you know, the bounds for integration for R would go from zero to one. So it's kind of like the same thing. Um, so let's just try to find the probability that C is less or equal to C. Oh my God, and what? I hate it when this, uh, oh, this yeah. now, um, this is a probability that root of X squared plus Y squared is less or equal to Z, but that's a probability that X squared plus Y squared is less or equal to Z squared, right? And so now, uh, now you kind of have to draw this region in the on the in the picture. So let's just try to put this like um you you know we have the um you we have the unit disk. It's kind of present everywhere else, and here we have this is like the equation. What is this? This is the equation of what? Uh, this is the equation of a. Uh, disk of radius r, right? Uh, well, I want to say r, but radius z. So you have like a disk of radius z, right? And that's the, you know, or maybe let me see if I can draw it in a different way.
Right. So we're trying to like we're trying to find where we want the probability that x squared plus y squared lie inside this smaller disk. Not necess no I mean we already knew it was inside the unit disk in general. So now we just want it to be we want something more specific for this to be inside the unit um to be inside this smaller disk, right? But again, any probability of this form, like a probability involving x and y, uh, e is an integral of the density of the joint density. But uh, oh, over where is this integral taking place? Over the values where x squared plus y squared are between, you know, are between zero and c squared. So this double integral is all taking place over this region. It's just that. Um, let me write that down. It's just like to compute this double integral, right? Obviously, we should switch the polar coordinates. But is, is that making sense? Um, that that's kind of what we're trying to do. Uh, so this integral, what 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 would we? I don't know if you remember like polar. So a was x equals r cosine of theta and y equals r sine of theta and dA, which was the y dx, becomes r dr d theta, right? So this is like the integral from what? From zero to two pi and uh, from zero to z of um, one over pi r dr d theta. Is that making sense? So that's why I'm saying that it is convenient to have called this random variable z, because if you had called this random variable r, then you would have had like an r here as one of the bounds, and here, then r when you switch to polar. So it's a little bit of a mess. So, but if you do this double integral, this is an easy double integral to do. You'll find this just gives you c squared. Is that making sense? So what I'm saying is that the probability for Z to be less or equal to Z is C squared. And the density function, uh, the density function would be the derivative of this with respect to z. And so that's just two z. So notice that this is uh, not, uh, this density is not uniform, right? Um, in fact, like you can think about it, like C was between zero and one. And so the density goes from zero to one is something like this, right? So this is the graph of which makes sense because like, you know, the farther you are from the origin, I mean, like, it's kind of like one of these games of throwing darts at, you know, uh, at a disc. Uh, like, the farther, like, you know, it is very hard to hit it, like, right in, near the origin. That's why that's, uh, you get more money or points if you throw the dart near the, near the disc, uh, near the center of the disc. So it's more likely for that to happen because there's kind of less area near the, the origin. But as you move further from the disk, uh, further from the origin, there's kind of, um, it's kind of the problem becomes easier because, um, you know, like there's kind of more area uh, to, for your dart to land. So is that making sense?
And then uh, what was the other norm, uh, useful, um, uh, what was the other, um, the other useful um, variable in polar coordinates, it was theta, right? So what it, what what was theta and polar coordinates? Well, you could say the easiest way to find theta and polar coordinates was to say that the tangent of theta was y over x, if you remember, right? Uh, so here you have to be a little bit careful. You could say that. Uh, so be, let's see if I should uh give you a reminder of. Right. Let me give you a quick reminder of how the tangent function looks like, right? So this is how tangent uh, of x looks like or tangent of theta looks like. So if you remember uh, here, you have minus pi over two and x equals pi over two. So if you want to talk about our tangent, right? Like the inverse of tan, you have to restrict the domain for theta. So you we can't take tan, uh, theta to be between negative pi over two and pi over two to talk about the arc tangent. So let me do that here. Or you could also, um, right, you know, that's one, it's kind of like the most symmetric option. You could also do it like, you could also take, um, Theta to be between zero and pi, if you prefer. But I'll keep it. Um, I'll keep it between minus pi over. Okay. So let's say. Okay. Let's take theta. Um. Well, okay. I'll take theta to be between zero and pi. Okay. Just to. So so that R ten so that R ten is defined. So that means that theta is kind of like R tangent, right? Of y over x. Right. But uh so if you so you could define like a random variable. Let's call this random variable W. It's kind of playing the role for theta. Okay, it's going to be playing the role of theta. So let's define W as the arc tangent of the random variable Y over divided by the random variable X. It's just that if we do it here like this, you know, um, because theta is uh, between zero and pi, if you want uh, these to go from zero to two pi, Kind of like the easiest thing to do is kind of multiply this by two. So I'll just multiply this by two. So because two theta is between zero and two pi. So it's just kind of to cover both. Um, if you just, um, you know, if you, if you just, if you do not include the two, that's kind of like working with the first two quadrants. But if you multiply by two, then you're working uh, with the four quadrants. Uh, well, yeah, so, well, you can, um, okay, right, you can, okay, you can, um, there are two ways to think about it. You could just, um, if you, pre in that sense, like, maybe that's why it's better to do it from minus pi over two to pi over two. You, but it's also like, you know, if you look back to the graph for tangent, um, okay, where is the graph for tangent? Uh, like what, okay, so right, like here, this is what you're talking about, right? That there's like an asymptote that there's like a vertical asymptote at pi over two. So you can just, like what I'm saying is that uh, you can say that the tangent function has an inverse from zero pi over two as open intervals, union pi over two to pi as open intervals. So 
maybe you know like the inequality you just have to be a little bit more careful with how you write it but um i can put it like um yeah yeah um it is a little bit pedantic, but yes, I agree that yes, that's uh, let me put it like minus pi over two. Um, like it, that doesn't like doesn't cause too much of um you know, right? So you can put it like this. Um, it just uh right. I can put it like this. Uh, union um pi over two theta pi, if you prefer. It's, in fact, like it doesn't matter too much whether you include the zero and the pi. Uh, that it also doesn't cause too much of an issue. Um, so it it is like um, you it like you know you could even work on it on the. I suppose you could even work on it on the. Like one option, if you prefer. Um, would be kind of to work on this on this interval, and then we just um, you know we multiply this instead of by multiplying by two, we can multiply it by four. <laughs> I think this will this should work. So let's say that you just wanted to keep the let's say you just wanted to keep the first interval. So the theta is equal is between um um theta is between zero and pi over two, and then let's multiply that all by four. So the theta, uh, you know, four theta is between uh, zero and two pi. And again, like here with strict inequalities, that's fine. Is that, is that making sense? So yeah, like, uh, in fact, that actually will be a little bit uh, better uh, for the calculations. So it may be good to have it that way. So I'm just saying that, um, right, I'm just saying that instead of just taking the arc tangent, I'm just multiplying it by four, kind of, kind of to secretly cover the four quadrants, not just uh, one. Uh, but that's that's kind of like an overall constant. It doesn't affect too much of like uh, what I was going to do. So let's just think about what would be the density like the more important thing is what's the density for this function. So what is uh, what is uh, the density of this function? Again, uh, I don't want to call the, I could have called this state like big theta, but it just can be too confusing. So I'm just going to keep this notation of random variables um, where I just call this um, Z and W or things like that. So again, the idea is that you have to find first the probability that W is less or equal to W. <laughs> And the density is going to be the derivative of that with respect to to W. Okay. So let's start to work it out. What is the probability that W is less or equal to W? Well, that's a probability that four times the arc tangent of Y over X is less or equal to W, right? So that's a probability that our tangent of Y over X is less or equal to W over four. Right? And that's a, uh, uh, here, like in this, uh, well, if you remember the derivative for a tangent is like, our tangent of theta is like one over one plus theta squared or one over one plus x squared. In any case, the point is that our tangent is like a, um, a positive function and tangent is also like a pos uh, an increasing function uh, on the region that we're working with. Because, uh, you know, the derivative of tangent anyways is secant squared. So it's always, uh, whenever it's defined, it would be positive. Uh, so it's fine to take, I'm going to try to say I'm, going to take tangent on both sides of the inequality. And you don't have to worry about the inequality being messed up um, when you take tangent on both sides, so.
ok? And so what is that? Uh, well, if we were doing this, then uh, what is a, this probability? You have to, again, think about how this looks like in the, in the on the XY plane. It is better to just think about this tangent of W over four, like I said, some number M. Let's call this M for slope, because if you remember, the slope is like the tangent of the line. Uh, the slope of a line is kind of like the, roughly like the tangent of the angle. So this is kind of related to a slope. So it's, let's just call this like M for that. So it is like probability of Y less or equal to um, M times X. Okay, and that is easy. And uh, here again, I'm multiplying by X on both sides because I suppose we were working, um, we started with um, assuming that X we were just looking at the part where the theta was between zero and pi over two. So X is positive in that region. We were like kind of in the first quadrant secretly. So um, it is okay to, to just multiply by X without worrying about messing up the inequalities. And so how, how does this, in a, how does this region look like on the XY plane? Like, again, you probably remember how to draw these um, equations like from calc three or, elsewhere. <laughs> what is it? Y equals MX is this line. And we're looking at the region in the first quadrant for where this inequality is satisfied. It's actually, this is kind of like the thing that you would do when you were asked to sketch domains in Calc 3, right? That's kind of how you would find this. So that is that thing. So you can do that. Uh, and this goes on, right? Like this goes on for eternity. So it is like um, it, this is just the integral of the of the joint density over this region, uh, where um, y is equal less to m x. Uh, well, it doesn't go forever because sorry, like um, we we still wanted uh, m and x and X and Y to be inside the unit disk, right? So secretly, all of this is happening inside the unit disk. So in fact, like the region is not, uh, you know, if you had no other conditions, then yeah, like the, the region would go up to infinity, right? But we do have like the condition that the, the variables had to be less or equal to one, right? They're norm. So it's actually kind of this slice of the pizza that we're looking at. So that's why that makes more sense to convert to polar if you were to, to do this integral. Um, right, so what, what does this integral give you? Uh, it gives you like the integral. Um, when you compare this, convert this to polar, it just is R sine of theta equals M. What, right, what is this bound in polar? It's like, um, r sine of theta equals m r cosine of theta. And so the tangent of theta equals m. OK, so theta has to go from 0 to w over 4, OK? Because m was a tangent of uh, w over 4. So it's like an integral from 0. This is why it's an, another reason why it's better not to, you know, to have used this like a, a different letter for this random function, otherwise you would have had like a, a huge mess of theta all over all over the place. So it's kind of like theta from here on, um, like this. Oh, sorry, this one, this was one over pi right here. One over pi. Okay. 
Right, and what does that uh, integral give you? Uh, this is an easy one to do. This is just a... Uh, uh, this is W R um this is one square over two so this is um ah I said I did it here Yeah, I think this is just W over eight. Is that making sense? Would it be W over eight pi? I wasn't sure how. That oh yeah, yeah. For, I'm forgetting the pi. Good, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks, thanks. And so the density would just be uh, the density would just be the derivative of this. So it is, uh, this one is a uniform uh, distribution, right? So th this one is actually uniform um, in the, in the angle. So let me think about something here. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, uh, right. So like, if you remember, like I think this is what what's uh, confusing me right now, but it will be fine. So it is. Um, if you think about it, W was like kind of four. It was like I define it as four arc tangent of y over x. Right. So it is like. Um, is kind of roughly like four theta in a sense, right? So what that means is that um, yeah, this should integrate to like theta its values between. I'm just thinking about 
it just looks a little bit weird in the integration. This is okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me just. Okay, yeah, yeah, no, it's fine. It's, it looks a little bit weird because of these constants that I chose, but it's okay. I mean, yeah, maybe I should have chosen like a different constants, but but it's more like like the important thing here is kind of like that the, this should be a uniform distribution. I mean, right, if I if I hadn't used, um, you know, if I had re literally has just chosen like, um, like arc tan of y over x, maybe, yeah, that was, should I have, if I had just chosen that without this annoying factor of four, then the, the density here would just have been one over two pi. Okay, um, that is like, uh, because it's just four times like, um, you know, it, like the thing is like, in, you would not have this four here. So this becomes four times bigger. Okay, yeah. So this would have been a better option for the problem. Yeah, yeah. And that is, uh, right, because like the typical angle, so if you think about it as going from zero to two pi, it's kind of like a uniform distribution um, on the interval one over two pi. So this would be like a uniform But again, you have to be careful. I mean, like, it's just like, it's a bit weird because, um, right, it, <laughs> you have to think a bit, a little bit of the arc tangent. So you have to fix that, um, but it can be fixed so that this works out. Um, so it is more, um, yeah, that's the problem with this arc tangent functions when they, you know, the fact that they can be annoying for those reasons. Now, let me tell you something that's really cool, which will be useful for um for next week, and that's like the moment generating function. Um, Um, let me give you, um, uh... okay. This is uh, a thing that you can define for uh, uh, one random variable. So this is, re this is defined for a random variable. And uh, x with discrete or continuous, it doesn't matter. And the definition it is at the moment, it is called the moment generating function of x, is a function of t 
and it's just defined as the expected value of e to the tx. Now, uh, let me give you an idea of why this is useful. So what is that? Like in the discrete case, so in the discrete case, Uh, when x takes values um, p1, sorry, x1 up to xn with probabilities p1, pn, right? The This expected value, the moment generating function is literally the sum from one, one equals one to n of e to the txi pi okay so that's a moment generating function in this case and in the continuous case when x has a density function F of x x, the the expected value or this moment generating function is just this. Is this where like the Laplace transform sort of comes in or? Uh, yeah, this is like, uh, if someone has ever seen the Laplace transform, uh, uh, this is more, this is basically the formula for the Laplace transform of the density. The only difference is that uh, the, uh, so yeah, it's, I mean, this is like, um, this is essentially uh, the Laplace transform the Laplace transform of the density is just that the convention, uh, typically the convention for the Laplace transform in engineering is that you, first, it is not usually like an integral from minus infinity to infinity, right? If you look at the Laplace transform, it's like an improper integral from zero to infinity or something like that. Um, because there are functions like, you know, um, they're just slightly different functions. Um, I mean, they're more general than a density function. A density function is very specific because it must always integrate to one and it's always non-negative. So it has like different properties. And the, in the usual definition of the Laplace transform, uh, there is a minus in this exponent, um, except that here, uh, here uh, we are using integrating from infinite from minus infinity to infinity and we're using e to the tx instead of e to the minus tx instead of e to the minus t uh, so yeah, if you, I, I don't know if you have taken by now a course that uses the Laplace transform, like in many universities that's done in differential equations, but in math 244, that's not a topic that is covered. So I'm not sure. Yeah. In which course you would see that for the first time, but Laplace transform is kind of like a useful way to solve differential equations, uh, basically because it turns, once you apply the trans like, like the Laplace transform, it kind of takes, turns derivatives into multiplication. So it be, it kind of turns like the, like the differential equation into a polynomial or like some algebraic equation. So it's kind of like convenient because of that. But uh, I mean, for us, like, yeah. So like a, a reason why you could have thought about, I mean, kind of, Uh, that is one, I guess, one of the motivations for why you may have come up with this formula, but, um, uh, like, you know, 
you don't have to think about it if you if you prefer it's just um you know it's just um a definition but it has like some useful properties and that's why it's convenient to kind of like introduce it um so let me but like i just want to emphasize first that this is really like a function of t uh so let me give you like show you in a couple of examples how it looks like so let's let me do a discrete case and a uniform um, a continuous case and a discrete case first to to warm up so let's think about the Bernoulli the Bernoulli random variable remember that I meant that probability that x equals one is just p and the probability that x equals zero is just uh p or uh, sorry q which was one minus p Right. So what would be the moment generating function for a Bernoulli? Let's put ver for Bernoulli. Well, if you look at the definition, it's the expected value or the average of e to the tx. Right. So that's like um the sum of e one equals from i equals one to two of uh, e to the t x i p i. Right. So that's what uh the first value is one. So it's e to the t times one. The probability of one is p, and the second value is zero, e to the t times zero, and the probability of the second value is q, right? Is that making sense? So the the generating function in this case is e to the t p plus q. That, so that's a moment generating function for a Bernoulli random variable. So and for, again, like I'll tell you in a second why um, this is like a useful thing to introduce, but it is literally like a function of t. That's my only point right now that it is a function of t, right? It, it, so that's why it's called generating function because you get a function of t. T has no particular interpretation in this context, so it's not that you have to think of t as um, as like. Um, like as something uh you know as time or anything of that sort you could if you want but um it's not necessary um Uh, is that making sense? Let's do another one, which will be the uniform distribution. Let's do a case for a continuous distribution. Uh, well, yeah, I'll tell you that in a second, but right now I'm just doing two quick examples to just make it clear that it is really like a function of t. <laughs> but yeah, I'll tell you, um, um, it is kind of like a mysterious object at the moment, but it just is a useful way to encode a lot of information about the random variable. You'll see why in, in a moment. And let me just do the uniform distribution and then I'll tell you, I won't say what it represents. I'll just tell you what it's useful for, which is like a different question, like, you know, but it's still, yeah, it, it will at least become clear why it's like a nice thing to have. So let's say X is a uniform random variable on on the interval A, B. So remember that means that, that, means that its density function is one over B minus A, okay? So what is the moment generating function in this case? Let's call it uniform. What's the, the, the generating function for the uniform? Oh, let's put uniform here. Okay, it is going to be a function of t. It's the expected value of e to the tx. And in the, uh, in the continuous version, that is an integral from a to b. Uh, a to b because that's where the, you know, the uniform distribution is only non-zero there. So it like, you know, instead of being an, an integral from minus infinity to infinity, you can reduce it to an integral from A to B. Um, and then this is E to the T X of so X DX. But this is like the this density is uh, one over B minus A. And this is not too bad to integrate, right? It's like, you're just integrating a, a normal exponential function. 
Okay. What is the integral of an exponential? It is the same divided by, you know, uh, by t. So the for the uniform distribution, the moment generating function is uh, e to the t b minus e to the t a over t times b minus a. Is that making sense? So again, e, I'm just. I just wanted to do these first two examples because it shows you, um, you know, it shows you that it really is a function of t, right? That's kind of my whole point uh, up to now, just to show you that it only ends up depending on t, like this moment generating function. And so now, uh, yeah, we can start now that at least we have two examples that uh, makes clear that it depends on t, we can discuss uh, why is it useful for. So what what's the point of the moment generating function? What 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 can you do with it? What can you do? Well. Uh, Notice that this is defined as the expected value of e to the tx, right? Uh, so if you think about the Taylor series for the exponential, right? This is the expected value of the sum from n equals zero to infinity. What is it? What is it? The Powers formula for uh, e to the x is like x to the n over n factorial, but x is kind of here tx to the n over n factorial. All right, so here I'm just applying the Taylor series um, for, for I'm just applying, applying this Taylor series for e to the x, right? It's just that here you don't have x, you have tx. So, but it is the same uh, Taylor series, right? So is that making sense? Okay, and uh, sure, uh, this is, it does, it's a bit of a bit tricky because if you remember the expected value is linear, that means that oh, when you have a sum, it, the expected value of a sum is the sum of the expected values. Here it's slightly more complicated because it's a series, like it's an infinite sum. So there's some sort of like justification that it needs to be done that you can kind of plug in the expected value inside, but it, it does work. Uh, uh, provided everything converges and whatever. So it is uh, really the expected value of t to the n and factorial x to the n. And now with respect to this, this is like a constant because um, uh, t is like a, a fixed variable. Uh, remember like the expected value, like the expected values take place with respect to the random variable x. So this is really, So what do we find? Uh, we find like a very nice representation of the moment generating function. It is like a power series where basically the coefficients are the moments of the of the random variable, basically. So e to the, the moment generating function is a power series, right? It's a power series in, ter in terms of t. Uh, whose coefficients are, ex except for this factor of n factorial, whose coefficients are basically the, mo the nth moment. Okay, so because if you remember, this was a definition for the nth moment of the random variable. So like, 
secretly what the moment generating function is doing is kind of like you compute all the nth moments and you kind of like put them together into a power series. Uh, so kind of every moments can still be identified from the others because they appear in different powers of T. Is that making sense? So for example, like just to make it more concrete, like let's just expand out what this is. When T equals zero, that just means E to of X to the zero. When T equals one, you get T over one factorial E of X, right? When T squared, this is get T squared over two E of X squared, blah, 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 right? So the moment generating function, like the first few uh, uh, terms in the moment generating function, What's the expected value of x to the zero? X to the zero is kind of like one. So it's like, this actually is still like one. Plus t, the, or like you, if you prefer, you can write it like this, like e expected value of x times t plus um, expected second moment of x times t squared over two, plus blah, blah, blah. Okay. So you see it is like a, uh, you know, if if you, for example, only look at the first three terms of the um, of the generating function, it it would be like a quadratic polynomial where the coefficients are one, the average value, and the second moment, and the cubic term would be like that is involves the third moment and so on. Is, is that is that making sense? Is that maybe uh, better? So, for example, for the Bernoulli, so for the Bernoulli. So the, for the, like let's let's just check let's just let me show you why this is useful. So for the Bernoulli random variable, we just found the um, we had found the 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 generating function is e to the tp plus q, right? So if you expand this out as a power series, right, is uh, n equals zero to infinity of T P to the n over n factorial plus q. So this is like um let me put the q first because otherwise it would be a mess. Let me put q here before the other. Professor, is the p like just multiplied? Is it in the exponent? Uh oh right like you're saying oops thank you so much uh yeah but there was like it's p is outside the yeah because just been multiplied right, yeah 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 good thank you yeah that helps a lot um mm, yes that makes our lives easier excellent thank you all right so it's again if you expand this out uh x equals zero, n equals zero gives you uh, one plus p, what's that, n equals one, you get, ah, oh, sorry, I should have put t to the end here. You get t over one factorial plus p times t squared over two plus blah, 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 blah. So it gives you q plus p plus p times t plus T um, uh, squared over two uh, oh, okay 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 uh, right and so one is what is q plus p uh, in a, i mean q was one minus p so you get one plus p t plus p t squared over two blah 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 so what i'm saying is that from here if you read out the coefficients what are the coefficients the first coefficient interesting coefficient is p and the second coefficient is uh, which is interesting is p as well so that means that the, for from that from there you would say that the, for the Bernoulli random variable the expected value is p 
and the second moment is P as well. Okay. But like with the point here is that you're literally just reading the, the moments from the coefficients that have started appearing in the power series. You didn't have to compute them separately. Is that making sense? In fact, like uh, the others uh, continue to be P, I guess, but that's less important. But I'm just saying like, it is kind of cool to see like, you know, that you can then just read off the, the, the moments from the, from the power series expansion. In fact, uh, what, um, you know, what ends, ends up being, uh, uh, well, you have to be careful. It's not, um, right. He said that P was outside the exponent. So P is always uh, appearing to the power one. So E to the PT, um, if you put the P in the argument of the exponential, uh, it would um, ex increase it. That's why I, I have those, the typo I made earlier. Uh, in fact, what's true in general, here's like the cool fo formula. Like once you have this power series expansion, you can kind of like take derivatives and evaluate at t equals zero. And you find that the nth moment, and this is true for like the continuous or the discrete case. This is like the most important formula. It just tells you that the nth moment is the nth derivative with respect to t of the moment generating function evaluated at t equals zero. So that is in practice how you would be able to find um, how you could determine the moment from um, the moment generating function. You take the nth derivative because like the idea of like the nth, taking the nth derivative is kind of like, I mean, it's kind of essentially the same as reading off the coefficients. For example, if you take the second derivative with respect to t, you get like this kind of goes away. And so you just are left with P in this case. Uh, so I, get, I don't know if everyone has taken like differential equations, but this is similar to what we would do there when you would solve in like a differential equation by power series expansion. It has like a different flavor, a similar flavor to that. Okay. Here's a, a really cool, um, this is why the moment generating functions are so useful. So here's the main reason why they're really, really useful. So this is like the, besides the fact that you can extract the nth moments from, from them. So here's why they're important. Thank you. So what happens if, let's say that X and Y are independent random variables. Let's say X, Y are independent random variables. Okay, uh, then you can define, you can define a, a new random variable, which is their sum, right? The sum of these two random variables. And my claim is that for the sum, the moment generating function of the sum will just be the product of the moment generating functions. If, I mean, let me write it in terms like just involving X and Y. Okay, 
So that means that uh, for independent random variables, that the moment generating function of the sum just becomes into products. Uh, let's see why that is true. Why? Because the moment generating function of the sum, again, the, the, the definition of the moment generating function is always e to the t x, but x is now x plus y, right? So this is e to the t x. Now you use the fact that the exponential, uh, right, turns sums into products. But then this is an integral from minus infinity to infinity, minus infinity to infinity of um, but because they are independent, the joint density function is the product of these two. So two, two, two. Okay, and so you see that because each of these, on you know, the point is that since everything splits into products of x and y, you can write this as as a product of two separate integrals. So you can write this as a. Okay, and what is that? That's uh, m of x t, m of y t. Is that making sense? So for sums, the For some, uh, the moment generating uh, function just becomes a product. And in fact, more is true because, um, I mean, like, there's nothing special about adding two, two, two random variables together. You could add n random variables together. So in, more generally, If um, x1, x2, up to xn are n independent random variables, it is exactly the same for, uh, proof, basically. Then the moment generating function of x1 plus x2 plus xn of t is the moment generating function of x1 times the moment generating function of x2 up to the moment generating function of x n. Is that okay? So let me give you an example of how this can be used for something useful. So here's like an application. I don't know if you remember like the binomial random variable. Well, uh, the binomial random variable was like um, doing N independent Bernoulli trials or N independent Bernoulli experiments. Uh, with parameter p, right? So the binomial, uh, the 
the moment generating fund because there are there are any independent um you were just counting the the successes in any independent Bernoulli trials, right? Like that's what the binomial was. So really, uh, we didn't write it that way, but you can think of the of the binomial random variable as the sum of any independent Bernoulli random variable. Is that making sense? So, um, because of that, the district, the moment generating function for the binomial one, it would be the moment generating function for the sum of these ember nulli tra uh, independent random variables. But uh, that's just the product. of each of the in the, in the individual moment generating functions. But we saw a couple minutes ago, right? Like that. we saw a few minutes ago, the, um, the moment generating function of a single Bernoulli random variable, right? What was that? It was uh, T e to the T plus Q, right? If I'm not mistaken. So, so this was just like P e to the T plus Q times p e to the t plus q, blah, 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 p e to the t plus q. So that, that means that the moment generating function of the binomial distribute random variable is p e to the t plus q to the n. Is that making sense? So what's the what is the expected value of the binomial distribution? If you look at the formula that I gave you a couple minutes ago, the the expected value would be the first derivative of the generating function with respect to t. So it is a derivative with respect to t of p e to the t plus q to the n at t equals zero. And what is that? That's just, uh, you have to use the chain rule at some point, right? This is n times p e to the t plus q to the n minus one times the derivative by the, deriv the chain rule, you have to multiply by the derivative of the inside, right? And this you evaluate at t equals zero. So when you evaluate this at t equals zero, you get n p e to the zero plus q to the n minus one times p. So you get n p plus q times p, but what is p plus p plus q? That's just one. So you get n times p. So that means that the expected value for the binomial random variable is n times p, which we knew before, right? We have found that using the Feynman trick if you remember that, which we already knew, but this is like a way to find it using the machinery of, um, of, of the moment generating function. Is that making sense? But it is, a lot more elegant to do it this way because if you then wanted like the second moment of the binomial, you just had to take their derivative one more time with respect to this. And right, you have to take the derivative of this one more time and then evaluate at t equals zero and that would give you the second moment. So next time, uh, I think there's a good place to end today. Next time what we will do is kind of compute this for the Gaussians. We'll see that the, um, it has like some nice consequences for Gaussian functions. Um, 
it would actually we'll use this to show that the sum of Gaussians is a, a Gaussian again, which is not obvious at all, but look, the proof is relatively straightforward um, uh, with this uh, with this formula. In fact, uh, just to maybe finish, the reason why the moment generating function is so useful is because um, of this, which is kind of like follows from the theory of the Laplace transforms, but it is like a, a uniqueness theorem, so. which again is kind of like a consequence of this. Uh, there's something that's called the Laplace inversion formula. But basically what it says is that if two random variables have the same moment generating function, they're essentially the same. Then x, y uh, have are the same, or or like you can put it like you can we can put it like have the same distribution function, which is all the the thing that we care. Or density function, yeah. Meaning that they have the same prob, they take the prob their probability functions are the same. Uh, so in a, like what like that means is that like uh, you know you can like for example next time we'll compute the the generating function for a Gaussian, and there's if another random variable has the same generating function as a Gaussian that forces a random variable to be a Gaussian. So it's kind of like a, a something that allows you to in kind of like it's like a bijection theorem that from from the random variable, you can compute the generating function, but there are no different generating functions that go to the same random variable, basically, without them having essentially the same density uh, distribution. So that's kind of what makes this uh, useful because it allows you to recover the random variable completely from the generating function. But again, I'll, I'll show you uh, next time how that works once we do it for the case of the Gaussian. So it's a nice, it is like a nice application. And that puts us like, basically an at epsilon distance of like the law of large numbers and the central limit theorem, which are like the last two topics for the course. So we'll start talking about that on, on Monday, if that sounds good. All right, have a good one, Professor. You too, you too. Bye. Thank you, Professor. Bye. Bye.